Good evening and welcome to Books to Make You Smile on this very special evening, World Book Night. I'm your host for tonight, Sandy Toxby, and this evening is presented by the Reading Agency in partnership with Specsavers. Uh, I hope you managed to watch Kate Moss in a fascinating conversation with Nobel Prize winner Kazuo Ishiguro, but don't worry if you missed it, as it will be available to watch later on the British Library Player. I'll be honest, I didn't know you could be a British Library Player, finally a sport. I might have excelled at. So then, April the 23rd, we are live from the British Library where I have penned many a word myself. Uh, I feel any mention of writing means I must mention that today marks the passing of William Shakespeare, who died on this day in 1616, possibly from over-celebrating his birthday. And there's a lesson there for us all, but I have no idea what it is. Uh, Shakespeare was, of course, a prolific writer. Why, by the time he was my age, he'd been dead for 10 years. I mean, that is remarkable. Uh, the British Library, apart from being the National Library of the UK, is also the largest library in the world by number of items catalogued. There's about 14 million books here, which even the dedicated reader might take some time to get through, but there would certainly be something for everyone. I am a passionate advocate of literacy. About a third of adults in England don't regularly read for pleasure, and sadly, that number goes up with young people. So, let's encourage everyone towards this calorie-free delight. The Reading Agency's annual World Book Night celebrates reading for pleasure, encouraging conversation about books, and for everyone to spend time reading. World Book Night covers the whole reading journey and is accessible for everyone from less confident readers to those who read regularly. It's a community celebration, bringing people together to share the joy of reading. And tonight we're celebrating 10 years of this life-affirming event. Since 2011, people across the country have come together on the 23rd of April to celebrate the books they love, to encourage others to read more, and to experience all the benefits that reading has to offer. We'd love you to join in sharing what you love about reading on social media using hashtag World Book Night. First, I'd like to introduce Karen Napier from the Reading Agency, the national charity that brings you World Book Night. Good evening, I'm Karen Napier and I'm the Chief Executive of the Reading Agency and happy World Book Night. At the Reading Agency, our mission is to tackle life's big challenges through the proven power of reading and we're thrilled to be celebrating 10 years of World Book Night tonight. Thank you to the British Library for hosting us in their magnificent building and I'd like to give a special mention to public libraries across the country watching tonight's events through the Living Knowledge Network. I'd also really like to thank our partners Specsavers for their support of World Book Night, as well as publishers and all of the many people and organisations involved in reaching readers across the country through our giveaway of 100,000 books. This World Book Night is all about books to make you smile, and our book list is full of exciting recommendations. There's something there for everyone, so take a look and choose your next read. Happy 10th World Book Night. Don't all of those look fantastically exciting? I have to say, I've, I could almost stop and read them all right now, but I've got work to do. Uh, you will have seen there a very special book, uh, Stories to Make You Smile. It's published by Simon & Schuster in partnership with Specsavers, which is available as a free, mm -hmm, 
free ebook uh, and audiobook download. It's available to download today, and we're going to be hearing some exclusive readings from the book a little bit later on. First of all, let me introduce my guests. I've got three guests. Uh, first of all, screenwriter and best selling author David Nichols, whose novels include One Day. Us and Sweet Sorrow. Uh, Bolu Babalola, a self-coined rom connoisseur, <laughs> uh, whose first book, Love in Colour, has been an instant hit since it was published earlier this year. And finally, man I know, Jamie Bing, uh, CEO of Canongate, an independent publisher and founder of World Book Night. Now, before we come on to World Book Night, I was just thinking we should decide what it is makes us smile. Jamie, is there something that makes you smile? Uh, quite a few things. My daughter, my youngest daughter, who's only 14 months old, makes me smile every time I look at her. That's something so. sort of instinctive, isn't it? You yeah. Look there. Yes, she I... smiles a lot too, and she just has an energy and joy that radiates out of her beautiful face and spirit. So that's the one that's probably most precious in terms of the things that makes yeah, me no, smile. Yeah, no, I get that. My grandson, who's four, I said to him recently, I said, what's your favourite animal? He said, I like mainly the nocturnal ones. I thought, that is my grandson right there. <laughs> uh, what about you, David? Um, I really missed the countryside. I'm very happy outside London. That makes me very happy. Uh, and I've mi I'm desperate to get out of this city, much as I love the city too. But I can't wait to, to, to actually get out in nature in it's some way. It's what the Japanese call forest bathing. That's right. actually very good That's for you. That's what I need. Yeah, you need yeah. a bit of that. <laughs> and Bolly, what about you? you? You look like you smile all the time, so <laughs> I don't need to ask you. Uh, being in Lagos in my family compound in Nigeria with my cousins, that makes me smile. It's just very, always a joyful reunion with yeah, them. A lot of family stuff. Yes. Anyway, Jamie, first of all, congratulations, uh, because you founded World Book Night just over 10 years ago. I mean, it's now a massive nationwide annual celebration. Um, how did t first of all, tell us how it came about. Well, when you say I founded it, I, I had the idea, because we were talking about World Book Day and how if there were ways in which World Book Day could be made more relevant to adults, because it had become an extremely successful initiative for encouraging children to read. And um, I just, it just kind of dawned on me that World Book Night would be a kind of obvious way to, to kind of distinguish World Book Day from an another, another initiative to encourage reading. And I also had published a couple of years prior to this kind of light bulb moment, a book called The Gift by a man called Lewis Hyde. And it was a woman called Margaret Atwood, who obviously you will know, great Canadian writer who told me about this book and said to me, Jamie, if, if you like this book as much as I think you will, do you promise me you'll publish it? And I said, well, of course. And we did end up publishing it at Canongate. And when we paperbacked it, we gave a thousand copies of this book away because it just felt like an essential thing. The book almost kind of insisted upon this kind of way of promoting it because Lewis's whole thesis was when you give something, you actually alter the thing that is being given by the act of giving. So, and I thought with books, that is so true. If you give someone a book, it's different from if you buy it. it, it you have a different relationship with the object. So we had this crazy idea that why don't we do a mass giving instead of just the thousand copies we gave away of the gift, why don't we try giving a million books away? Wow. Which sounded insane, and it was insane, but luckily the whole publishing community got behind it. All the authors were involved in. We had 2,000 bookshops and libraries involved in it, and we had the two biggest printers in the country. And it was just a mass initi initiative. The BBC were essential to the whole project. And we did indeed give a, thousand, uh, a million books away, 25 titles, one of which was David Nichols's One Day, which was a brilliant book to have in the opening. Yeah, so it was on the very first uh, World Book Night list, 2011. What did that mean to you? So you're talking about, Jamie's talking about giving away all these thousands of copies that it's shared across the yes. country. I mean, that event was amazing. And uh, to sort of sit next to people like Alan Bennett and Nick Cave and not really be able to say anything to any of them, but to be there was a real thrill in this huge event. With, they felt like that about you, I'm be sure. I'm, uh, but um, this extraordinary event with all these people and uh, uh, more than that, just the idea that uh, 40,000 people were, were being handed that novel that, that, that very night. It's amazing. I mean, reading is a solitary act, but once a book is shared and spoken about, it becomes part of the reading community, and that's a real uh, honour. So it was a great thrill for me. Jamie, why did you feel it was necessary? I mean, I get about getting kids reading. What was the reason? Well, you know, as a, someone who'd been publishing for quite a while by that stage, I, I realised there were a lot of hurdles from when a book gets written to it actually being read. 
one of which is to get it published. But even once it's been published, it has to be sold into the bookshop. Someone has to go into a bookshop. Someone has to have money. Someone has to get the copy of the book and then have the time to read it. You know, these are all sorts of ways in which books don't get read. And I felt we could short circuit the whole process <laughs> in a very dramatic way by giving a passionate lover of a particular book to give that book to someone they don't know and say, have this as a gift. I love this book. You might love it too. It's a very simple idea. And I think it does something beautiful, that sharing of what is in, innately uh, an act of giving. I think a writer gives something just by the act of writing. And so it felt true to the spirit of what literature is and the very essence of what that kind of exchange that goes on between a writer and a reader. So that's, a, that's the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful gifts I think there is. No, I can understand that. I, I, I walked past a bookshop in Brighton the other day and I saw a handwritten note, clearly from the bookseller, that said, please buy this book, it's really good. And I just thought, yeah, well, yeah, that's a handwritten, yeah, why not? Yeah. Absolutely. Now, Bolly, you've had no trouble having to sell your book, even <laughs> when the bookshops have been closed, because your first book, Love in Colour, it's, am I right? It's a collection of rewritten love stories, is that right? Yes. Do you want to describe it for us? Or? Yeah, it's an anthology that takes inspiration from folklore and mythology from around the world. They're original, but um, I made um, an effort to pay homage to the roots and the cultures that they came from. Um, but it, crucially, it centers women and their desire. And it's a, I think it's a feminist angle and it's not about damsels in distress and princes coming to save the day. It's also about their journey of self-love and self-knowledge. Well, I think it brings romance novels into the, uh, into the present day, do you not think? I mean, because romance novels have always been very popular. Why do you think that is? And, wh and why did you choose to write romance? I think people are always looking for something that brings them hope and joy and hope and joy that they can bring to their daily lives. And I think that's why I was drawn to romance. Just, it wasn't even something that I actively chose. I think in the media that I consumed, I, I was drawn to that. And so when I started writing and figuring out that I could actually make up stories and put pen to paper, um, that's just what fell out of me. I think it's just something that felt very natural to me. I love exploring connection and what draws us to people. And so, and what were the things that inspired you? You say the media that you tended to look at. What was the sort of things? Um, I was always drawn to rom-coms, always. So um, I started off stealing <laughs> romance books, romance novels from my mother's library um, and hiding them under my bed because I was way too young to be reading them. <laughs> Um, are but you, are you were a child of the Disney movies as well. Are you I child? loved Disney movies, yeah. of course, and I think also that's where kind of I was started beco becoming interested in folklore and mythology because, of course, that's where the, the origins lie. And I just loved. Um, I w watched when Harry met Sally when I was like ten or eleven, and I was like, yes, this is this is what I want to do. These are, this is like, I want to tell stories like this and I like stories like yeah, this. You were too young for that. I was way too, way young, for too young for that. My parents didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so talking about human connections and love, your books are also uh, about human connections and love. Your most uh, recent novel, Sweet Sorrow, is about a first experience of, of love. Can yeah. you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, I mean, often the, the, the idea for a book comes in reaction to what you've written before. And I, in one day, one day is very much about relationships in your 20s and 30s. And, the novel that came after us was about the 40s and 50s and marriage and family and what that means for romantic relationships and I thought I'd go back to the initial experience you know first love is by very definition something that only happens once and um, it's overwhelming you know for good or bad it's a, it's like learning a, a, a new set of emotions and I, I felt that there was uh, a lot of comedy in that and a lot of pathos and I wanted to write a very classic coming-of-age summer love story um, so it's about uh, a boy who hates the idea of romance and particularly the idea is very intimidated by the idea of books and literature and culture but he meets a girl who's um, playing Juliet in an amateur production of Romeo and Juliet well, there's no greater story of first love first I love. think yeah. definitive <laughs> first love chosen well there and he realizes that the only way he's going to get to see her is by joining in the production so reluctantly he takes on the part of Benvolio and it's a very classic kind of Gregory's Girl type summer love story, but contrasting Romeo and Juliet, that very heightened classical notion of first love with the kind of the mess and embarrassment and an awkwardness and gaucheness and ecstasy 
of, of first love in real life. But I'm really interested that you both have taken inspiration from, from other writers and from other stories. Um, uh, is, has that always been the case? Have you, everything that you've read so far, is that a thing that it spurs you on? I think, so I'm Nigerian and our storytelling tradition in a lot of places in Africa is is an oral storytelling tradition. So you hear a story and then in retelling it, you put your own spin on it and you bring it to, your, to, the, to, your, to the times that you're in. And I think, I kind of think that that's my, that's what I'm drawn to. I like taking inspiration from things. I, I, in the process of writing Love and Colour, I found that I really enjoy taking inspiration from things and the roots and then kind of translating them um, with my own kind of flair and the way that I see the world and the prism within which I see romance. Um, and I think you discover so much about the world, but also yourself and how you see um, what's presented to you and the stories that came before. But it means presumably if you come from an oral tradition where, as it were, improving around the riffing around the yeah. thing is fine. You don't feel constricted by the original exactly. story. Exactly. There's a freedom within that kind of form of storytelling, yeah. I find. I mean, David, did you feel any way that Shakespeare's going, <laughs> I wouldn't have written it like that? Well, I think that's the, that's the joy of it. You're sort of having a conversation with this, um, this... I mean, if you take Romeo and Juliet and you pinch together the Romeo and Juliet scenes, there aren't that many, and the scenes where they're happier, there are even fewer. But it's, it's, uh, it's such a, a beautiful, eloquent, exciting evocation, a universal evocation of the experience of falling in love. And Shakespeare was someone that I was initially very um, scared of as a teenager. But um, once you overcome that anxiety, I mean, it's great to see Much Ado About Nothing in this year's selection because everything I've ever written is stolen from Much Ado About Nothing. <laughs> when Harry Met Sally is, is you know, is a, is a modern twist on Precisely. Much yeah. Ado About yeah. Nothing. Yeah. It's the great original romantic comedy. And so even though Shakespeare can feel quite imposing and monumental and intimidating, if you take a deep breath and, and overcome those little moments that perhaps you don't understand, keep going. Um, he's a wonderful, incredible, inspirational writer. And everything I've ever written, I've stolen from Shakespeare and Hardy and Dickens and all of these wonderful writers. It's all, it's all fuel. I think it's absolutely, and it's, it's great to say it, I think is really honest and wonderful. I have to make a confession. Um, years ago, I was in the theater company at Regent's Park for the Shakespeare. And there was a, it was, we were doing Comedy of Errors, and there was two pages that clearly had got big laughs in Shakespeare's time, and that's <laughs> all Shakespeare would have cared about. And it was just dying on its thing. So uh, the director said to me, could you write two pages that we could go in here? Got massive laughs, and not one critic noticed. <laughs> so I think it's fine. I want, I've, I've actually, Shakespeare with additional material. Polish. Yeah, additional material. <laughs> by me. Um, so, Jamie, World Book Night is all about encouraging more people to read. Um, there's fantastic recommendations, aren't there, each, mm -hmm. each year on the annual book list, and people are encouraged to share. If, I always wonder, if you were talking to somebody who wanted to read more and didn't know where to start, I never like to be prescriptive. I, never, I mean, so that, the list is a great place to start, but how do you sit down with somebody and say, OK, I, I hear you want to read more. This is what I'm going to recommend to you. Oh, it's such a difficult one, isn't it? Because uh, it's a very subjective thing, reading, and different books uh, do different things to different people at different ages. So there is a kind of randomness about it, and your connection with the book is, is one that you can't predict. So it's, it's something you have to kind of think carefully on, which is why I think trying to... Uh, recommend writers who are accessible is the and to me there are writers who are, are great writers who are also reading cre write incredibly readable and accessible books and certainly for someone who doesn't regularly read for pleasure i'm always going to be recommending something that is narrative driven a brilliant story with great characters and something that is going to hopefully make you laugh and cry because i think if a book is doing isn't doing both to you I think something's missing because that's what Shakespeare did. You know, it's the, it's the gamut of emotions you want to take a reader on. And I think I would always be urging those kinds of books. Like one day, well, actually, um, David's new novel, I was listening to Rory Kinnear's brilliant reading of it on the way. And just the way he described it, it was just... It's, it's, there's so much pathos and so much humour in it and the relationships are so good. And it's who doesn't relate to the experience you're talking about, a kind of disco at school, that kind of... So it's, it's that stuff that... It's all about connection. And so the reader's got to feel some sort of connection with the book, even if it was written centuries ago and the person was a different gender, a different background, different whatever. They've got... It's the inner humanity of the book. That's what we... Uh, any book that has that is a great book, I think. 
Do you know what it made me think of when you were saying that? There was a great a choreographer called Bob Fosse, and he always said a good musical, you have a good time in the crying scenes. And maybe it's the same with a book, you should still be having a good time even in the crying scenes, yeah, maybe that fits. It's, yeah. it's cathartic and you, it makes you feel, and that's what you want when you read a book. And that's the incredible thing about a book. It can make your heart race, it can make you laugh out loud, and it can make you cry. And it is just, it's, it is alchemy that words on the page can transform your state of mind. Kind of, if that's not alchemy, what is alchemy? I don't know, but that to me almost is the definition of alchemy, which is why I'm in awe of all writers and the readers who turn the writers' books into the things that they become, which is the thing we must never forget. The readers make the books what they become. And do you feel a responsibility now, Bolu, now that you've had a success with your book, that people will come to you and say, well, you obviously know about books, what shall I read? Do you, it's, apart from saying my own book, what, I mean, do, you feel, <laughs> do you feel a sense of responsibility? And what would you recommend to people? I think people fear that they need to read things to impress other people. Um, I would say, what do you normally like? What are you interested in? Even in film, what are you interested in? And I would go from there, because reading, like you said, is a very subjective thing, and you, I don't want you to feel connected to it. So what I like might not necessarily be what you like, but I can recognize a good story, and if it has a subject matter that you're drawn to, I will recommend it. But I would say it shouldn't be a restrictive thing yeah. or something that you feel like, oh, I need to read this because it's a classic and everybody says it's good. Okay, but are you interested in the subject matter? If you're not, don't, don't force yourself. Because it's also great to be surprised. Isn't exactly. It? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what was the book about the bees? What was, was it called? Just called The Bees? It was the one was set in... Did you read that? It's it was the a Sue Monkton book. It's, yeah, just set in a hive of bees. And I thought, oh. And I hadn't got anything to read. And somebody... And I was on a train. And I read... It was wonderful. Absolutely. <laughs> so surprise yourself. Yeah. Although, I have to say... When in doubt, I would recommend a classic. I mean, you mentioned Hardy and yeah. so on. I would always say to people, well, Dickens is a classic for a reason. Yeah, I, I mean, I love Dickens. It, I don't know if he's read and loved in quite the same way. I mean, my way into Dickens was actually through TV adaptations and, and screenplays, which perhaps made him seem more accessible. But uh, reading Great Expectations was a real breakthrough for me. I'd always imagined the classics were uh, inaccessible and intimidating. And I'd never had such a strong sense of identification with the characters, with, with Pip, his confusion, the unrequited love, the, the, the ambitions that aren't really thought through, the, the vanity, the self-loathing, all those anxieties seem to me extremely uh, relatable. It's, it's a, not a great word, but I, I didn't find the work as intimidating as I'd expected to. So, I, 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 which isn't to say that um, uh, I'm constantly pushing classics on people, I, I think. Uh, as Bobby said, you know, we should not be snobbish and read widely and read all kinds of books. But, but those books did have a, a huge effect on me at, at a very particular age when I was 14. And also, 15. I think important to remember, with, with Dickens in particular, written in magazine installments and written to be read aloud. Mm. And actually, if you read it as it was originally intended, in those, it's almost like a soap opera then. You only get a little bit and you've got to wait for the next bit and you hear it read aloud. I think it's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. That word cliffhanger comes from Thomas Hardy. There's a, I think it's um, uh, one of his two on a tower ends with someone hanging oh, from right, a cliff. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so there's the, the constant sense of um, set pieces and excitement and tension just in chapter after chapter, which is, I think, just pulls you on. Yeah, having said that, yeah, I, do, I think when I read Pride and Prejudice for the first time at 14, it opened up a whole new world to me. But I think people just, disregard classics they think oh rom-coms like why would a, a book set then be have the same tenets as a, as a rom-com and I say well Pride and Prejudice to me is the blueprint yeah. you know um, and I think that's why I say what do you what are you interested in and I will then go back and see if what lines up with that because I think people cut off classics because they feel like it can't be relevant to them um, so it's about opening up new worlds I think and can you remember a book that you read when you were young that you thought, actually, I, I want to do that? What that book has just done to me, I want to do that to other people? Yes, it was Pride and Prejudice, Pride and Prejudice. actually, yes. I, because obviously it's a world completely different <coughs> to mine as a British Nigerian girl living in East, growing up in East London. But I related to it and I fell in love with the characters. And not, of course, not Elizabeth, but not just Elizabeth. The people who populated her world. And it was so witty and she was so sharp-tongued and sharp of mind. Um, 
And I just fell in love with it. And I didn't, and I was so perplexed by the idea that I understood it because it didn't make sense for something so old for, to be so relatable to me. And I think it really taught me the power of literature. Um, and writing in general. But I love that, that, uh, that uh, you can read something from a completely different culture, completely different age, and find something of similarities in it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Because we're people in this. I've been struggling to read um, The Tale of the Genjai, which is the very first novel ever, it's a thousand years old, written by Lady Murasaki. But there's bits of it I find very difficult, bits of it I just think, oh yeah, I get that, it's a thousand years ago. Yeah. You go, oh, okay, I got you. What about you, Jamie? Was there a moment when you thought, you'd, you did, did you did I, you want to be a writer or you wanted to? Uh, no, uh, no, I never kind of, I've always been kind of in awe of writers. I've always read quite a lot. I talk about early books, I, I remember vividly finishing the first book I really felt I read on my own a chapter book which was fantastic Mr Fox by Roald Dahl and that was a kind of that began a real uh long love affair with Roald Dahl's writing which led through all his children's books and then I started reading his short stories and actually he was one of the writers who helped me kind of migrate from kind of children's literature to to more adult stuff and I think he's um a consummate storyteller but um no, I, I kind of write a lot in small bits and I, and I work a lot with words, but I, um, I, first of all, I don't have time, but I don't, I don't also believe I have the, the, the talent. I, I know what an extraordinary difficult thing it is to write good books or great books. And um, I think my, my kind of skills are better used kind of helping promote and publish writers rather than try and become one myself. It may be being very modest, it's hard for me to say. What about you, David? Early book that made you think, wow, this is a thing? Uh, I mean, uh, uh, to begin with, I remember reading the Moomin novels and really loving them, and as they went on, they became more and more melancholy, and it was a strange kind of pleasurable melancholy. It's very strange, the mother ones, wants to yeah. go and live in the kitchen wall and stuff. Yes. It's very, all very odd. And then the ones in November and winter, and they have a kind of, almost a kind of Bergman-esque, gloom that yes. I that I actually found really really enjoyable that's, that's us Scandinavians yeah. I'm afraid <laughs> <laughs> and touching and I think comedy as well was a big way in for me um Sue Townsend's uh Adrian Mole was a massive influence I mean my first novel Start of a Ten is 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 obviously influenced by Adrian Mole and Great Expectations um <laughs> Douglas Adams was a great way in I would suggest to you know to people who are wary of reading that that comedy is a is a great way to go and Helen Fielding, Douglas Adams, Nina Stibbe, I think, is a wonderfully accessible, witty, funny writer who also has terrific pathos, which I think was Sue Townsend's great gift. Mm. Uh, so um, for me, comedy uh, on the page was, was, a, was a, a big inspiration and a, a great way into books. And I think it's, it's there even in some of the most serious books. So you mentioned Margaret Atwood earlier on. And um, I once had to do a double act with Margaret Atwood. And it was a nightmare. She was hilarious. <laughs> She's really funny. <laughs> really funny. <laughs> I just thought, this is not what I was expecting. I was expecting somebody doing something about, the, you know, the rather doer life. But no, no, she was funnier than me. She was on the annoying side. Uh, Jamie, I just want to talk briefly about Letters Live. Um, yes. which I have been involved in. For anybody who doesn't but, know... Oh, look, for it, not that it's inspired Letters Live, but Letters of Note. Here's one on dogs, which I brought for you, actually. Letters of Note dogs and Letters of Note space, which is for you, David, and I brought you grief, oh. which is so wow. beautiful. Well it's gone. Anyway, yeah. Letters Woo. Live, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> letters Live. Um, I'll what... trade you my dog one, if you like. It'll be all right. What would you like to know about I'd Letters like to, Live? Just anybody who doesn't know about it, just, just tell us a little bit about it. Uh, really simple idea. We get brilliant performers such as yourself to take to the stage and David's done this well you did the yeah. second ever letters live so did, yeah. but it's mainly actors we get we get brilliant actors to read letters to a live audience but no one in the audience ever knows which actors are going to be coming out onto the stage or what letters they're going to read and um, yeah we did the first of these in 2013 and we've done about 80 of these shows and we do a lot with the Natural Lit National Literacy Trust with it. We always support different literacy charities through them, but they are a brilliant show. The last big one we did was at the Royal Albert Hall, and we're doing another one back there on the 30th of October. And if you've never been to a Letters Live, they are, talk about the roller coaster of emotions. One moment you are laughing out loud, and then you are, honestly, you have people weeping in the audience. And that was always the, it might sound um, quite sadistic, but we did really want people to kind of uh, emote and go through a, an intense experience, both uh, positive and, and, and kind of moving 
in, in, in a letters live show. Well, I love it. And one of the things I was just thinking is we were talk, encouraging people to read that if people feel that maybe, you know, a large novel is too much for them, uh, reading a selection of letters of which are so varied is a wonderful way in. Completely agree. And I, I, I think um, there's, they also are, they're these like little time capsules letters. And there's something, what I loved about Letters Live was that we were taking this most private form of correspondence, unless it's an open letter to a newspaper, it is typically addressed to one person. And then we were putting that out into the kind of th the outside world. So in a very public space, you were having this per a personal letter read out. And that did something very interesting to the audiences because they kind of zone in on the letter almost as if it's being addressed to them. Mm. The performer is also zoning in on the letter as if they are the writer of the letter. And yet, so you're taking this very personal, very kind of minute, kind of intense interaction really between one person and another, and you are kind of sharing it. And I, I think it's, um, I, as you say, the letter is a beautifully accessible form of narrative as well. Yeah. And um, some, there are brilliant novels written through letters, and the letter, not at least in Jane Austen, often plays a crucial role within within the within the plot. So, because um, I, I keep trying to think about different avenues in. Bolo, I'm very taken with your idea. Of your, you're telling us about the oral story tradition, because it seems to me if there are adults who say, "Listen, I don't read. I don't read for pleasure," but telling a story is a great way in to hook people in. Do you think? I, I, I wonder if we should have we should have adult storytelling. We have lots of kids get told stories, but when's the last time an adult sat down and told you a story? That's true, actually. And I, but the thing is, I think we tell each other stories all the time, but we don't mm. think of the value of it. That's why people people love Twitter. People love thread anecdotes on Twitter because it draws people in, and it also opens up an experience as well. And it really is it builds a community because people are like, oh, I relate to that, yeah. I understand that. Um, and it opens up the world to people, I think. Um, and also, I think, for me, storytelling goes hand in hand with comedy, I think. It, I, couldn't, I couldn't imagine reading a story and connecting to it without kind of a dose of humour. I actually adored Adrian Mole when I was, when I was growing up. And um, I also love Louis, Louise Renison, who is kind of like... Uh, who wrote almost a female version of Adrian Mole because it was Georgia Nicholson series. Um, because it, there's, just a hum there's such an element of pathos in, in humour and I think being human is so humiliating that if you don't, <laughs> if you don't and have awkward. A, an awkward yeah. and yes. excruciating, if yes. you don't have humour, it's just how do we survive? Yeah. You know? I mean, I've only got a sense of humour because I went to boarding school. That's literally <laughs> how I got through it. Um, David, tell me about, because I think it's sometimes difficult for writers to talk about the role of reading for them, because presumably no. if you're writing, you don't want to be influenced by somebody else's style. You don't want to go, oh, well, they're just brilliant, so I'm going to stop now. Or, you know, is, yes. it, is it difficult sometimes? It's a difficult balance. Every book I've ever written has a kind of um, mood board of other books that I've read and admired, and I want to take a little bit from, you know, Sweet Sorrow is, is a little bit of the go-between, meets a little bit of Goodbye Columbus. It's a kind of, there are, there are influences, and that's mm. great. But quite often I have to put writers down and, uh, because it's too close to what I want to achieve, or there's a kind of a sort of creative envy that, that means that it's not a good idea to be reading that writer while I'm writing. And I've often found myself taking on, a, particularly with comedy, taking on some of uh, someone else's comic trips, tricks and foibles and tone uh, because I admire it so much. So I haven't written original prose for a while, but when I go into that mode, I, I tend to read perhaps um, novels from abroad or novels in translation or novels that, that aren't anywhere near what I'm trying to achieve while at the same time carrying with me all these other great books that I've read, which are fuel. You know, it's, it, mm. it, it, I can't imagine a day without reading. For me, it's, it's essential. And everything I've written has drawn from experience, from life, from people I've met, but, but for the most part from other wonderful books. And what about you? Are you able to, to, to read while you're writing? I'm precisely the same. I find myself mimicking authors that I really admire, so I try to just stick to non-fiction mm -hmm. a book that i always return to is all about love by bell hooks because my subject matter is romance and love so it explores love but it's non-fiction so it's in a very practical way um, and it's very lucid and it's and it draws on the beauty about love um, but in a very kind of 
it's clinical without being cold. And I think I need that. And it helps me excavate the emotions that I need to excavate without mimicking another another author. Because that is the difficulty, isn't it? Yeah. I, uh, you, I'm sure you're too young to remember, but there was a wonderful writer called Alan Corrin. He was a great uh, journalist. I'm sure you remember We Alan. published a collection of his, uh, oh. of his pieces. He was brilliant. He was a genius. Uh, um, hilarious. Hilarious. Very did, you, funny. did you know Alan Corrin's book? Anyway, um, I, we were great friends, and I said to him, why don't you write a novel, Alan? You're a wonderful writer. And he said, because I can't write The Great Gatsby. And I said, well, that's all right. It's already been done. Um, <laughs> but he just, it was, he was blocked yeah. by the fact that he so admired this one book that he couldn't then decide to sit down and write a book. Um, when it comes to publishing, Jamie, you were responsible for the UK public publication of Jan Mortel's Life of Pi, which did yep. quite well. Um, it was a happy experience. Happy experience. This book was born as I was hungry. It was the <laughs> opening line of it, which, uh, which I always like. How, how do you know, because you, you love to read, how do you know that a book is good and that you think, I'm going to put my energies into making sure that this gets shared? You don't, you don't know it's going to be successful. All you can know is the effect it has on you. That, that's the only thing. And, of course, the longer you publish, the more experience. And, you know, I work with a brilliant team of people. There's not only a great editorial team at Canongate, but just brilliant colleagues across the departments. And I was thinking about... I'm not actually in a book club, but except... I feel like I'm in a constant book club at Canongate. It's just like, because the acquisition meetings where we're talking about a book and everyone's read the proposal as it often is for nonfiction or if it's a novel, you're reading the whole novel and you're discussing the book and there's fantastic, you know, divergence of opinions at these. Sometimes people feel really strongly it's a great book. Someone else just might leave them a little bit cold. It doesn't happen that often. It's like, unless it's, you know, a kind of what classic kind of Marmite book of some sort, but... There's all sorts of interesting kind of things you have to weigh up as a publisher when you're working out, are we going to give this particular book a slot on our list or make an offer to the author? doesn't necessarily mean we'll get the book because there might be several of other, other publishers also wanting to publish it. But you just have to trust your gut. I, I, you know, Life of Pi was turned down by a great number of publishers in this country. and That's why I mentioned it. I thought you could feel yeah, smug. Yeah, and it was... And it was uh, only Faber and ourselves who bid on the book and to me I read the book and it was I had a beautiful experience with Life of Pi because I was in New York seeing an editor a wonderful woman called Anne Patty who was an editor at Harcourt Brace and she had inherited another author we published called Michelle Faber so she'd be very keen to find out what Michelle was writing next and it was before he wrote his incredible Victorian novel The Crimson Petal and the White and at the end of this lunch, she says to me, you know, God, I should have told you about this book earlier. Yesterday, I preempted the rights from this young Canadian writer. He's never been published in America before. He's called Yann Martel, and she starts pitching me Life of Pi, the story. And I'm like, fuck, this sounds a great story, you know. And just, I say, can I get the book? And she says, I go back to her office after lunch, and she's got a really slow printer in her office. And after... A, 150 pages of printed of the book I'm like I've got to leave here otherwise I'm going to miss my plane tonight I'm flying out of back to London so I do get to the airport just make my flight I'm on the plane I literally turn page 150 when I in my head I'm somewhere above the Atlantic and Richard Parker and Pi are in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and I turn over the 150th page and I'm like at that talk about cliffhanger I was like <laughs> what is going to happen what is going to happen? Anyway, that's how Life of Pi came. It was a recommendation. That's Again, a reader's it, nightmare, isn't No, it? it was a reader's nightmare, but it was a recommendation from the editor who bought it. It said, you must read this book. And as Michel Faber's publisher, I have a feeling you're going to love this novel. And I did, and my colleagues loved it, and we ended up making an offer, and Yan decided to go with us, and then we got lucky. It won the Booker Prize. That, that, we couldn't have predicted that. Although I did say in my pitch letter, I think this could win the Booker Prize to Yam when I said, because I thought it had all the elements. In fact, full circles, Margaret Atwood was one of the first great champions of that book. She, she wrote an amazing review for it in the Sunday Times of that novel. And I, I'm sure that was one of the things that was in the ether with the judges when they were, you know, because, uh, yeah. But that's some of it, isn't it? Things that are in the ether, finding the right happy connection. Did you, you've clearly had a happy publishing experience probably with, your, with your book. And has that made a big difference to you, that you've made those relationships with the equivalent of Jamie, as it were, at your Absolutely. Yeah. I have a very close relationship with my editor, and I think she trusts my voice and I trust her voice. And 
and in her I have a great advocate so um, nothing unpleasant can get to me because it gets to her first. And she's like, no, 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 yeah. no. she's not going to do it. Exactly. Yeah. Firewall, I, firewall. <laughs> yes. And it's really the ideal um, relationship because if she suggests something to me, I know it's because she trusts my capabilities and my talent and um, it makes me challenge myself. So it's been very, very, and she's publishing, we're publishing my next novel with them as well. And um, it's, it, it, I think it's made me a better writer. Yeah, I think you need that. You need a bit of pushback. Do you think that, today? Yeah, I mean, it's horrible. You yes. never really want to have any, <laughs> any, any, any response except this is amazing. Um, but it's absolutely necessary. Yeah, good, good editing, good notes. Uh, uh, and the desire also to make it as good as it can be. You're, you're not allowed to take the book off the shelf and tweak it. You know, once it's out there, it's, it's done. So it's in your own interest to, to, to challenge yourself and make it as polished as it possibly can be at that particular time. My, uh, my father was, I come from a long line of writers, my father was also a writer, and he always used to say to me when he was writing a book, he said, the thing is, Sandy, first you decide what kind of fish you're going to catch, and then you catch your fish, and then you fillet it until you present to everybody the finest piece of the fish you decided to catch. And I really like that. Mm. So mm. I enjoy the process of rewriting and, mm -hmm. and, and the editing process. Mm. I think it's a really nice bit. Um, let's come on to inspirations. Uh, start with you, David. Anybody in your life who inspired your love of reading? Is there a, a family member or a teacher that you say, um, ooh, that I had, person? I had good teachers. I mean, for me, it was absolutely about libraries. Uh, Eastleigh Public Library uh, was my second home, really, and it was it was as much a part of my education as as school. I mean, I I spent three or four nights a week there. I loved it there. I worked my way initially at random, but but the, then with more focus through the shelves, working out what I loved, and it was uh, to have access to such a wide range of literature to go from James Herbert to Dickens to you know, to, to anywhere. To, it was 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 really thrilling and exciting and I owe such a huge debt to the library system in, in general but, but that particular library in particular uh, a terrible sentence <laughs> anyway uh, the important thing is that is that it was I, I wouldn't dream of being a writer without without access to the library system but isn't that wonderful isn't it wonderful as we're sitting here that libraries are reopening doesn't that mm. make you yes. isn't it wonderful just to be here yeah but we're not we're not uh, virtually speaking to each other from our homes and so on i think it's uh, i think it's fantastic i think it's a really wonderful thing what about you Bolu? Is it an inspirational member of your family or a, a building or yes my both my parents are are massive readers my father in particular and he is a storyteller he's a real oral story storyteller and i think um so Wale Shoyenka, I think, is the first African person to win a Nobel Prize for Literature. And he's actually from my hometown in, um, in Nigeria, my family's hometown. Um, I think even from the same village there. Um, and so I grew up around his books. And I, my parents were very, they, d they didn't hide things from me, which is why I watched When Harry Met Sally when I was 10 years old. <laughs> um, and so I always had access to these books. They were always on the shelves. And I think it was really pertinent for them to be black authors and African authors and Nigerian authors, um, because I was like, oh, I can do this. Mm. And um, African literature is so poetic and so rich. Um, and so when I write like that, I feel like I'm part of a legacy. It was really important to me to be around that. But it's really important, isn't it, to find those role models for yourself. I exactly. Think that's so great. What about you, Jamie, that, uh, that you decided? It's interesting you talk about libraries, David, that there's a quote in David Mitchell's novel, The Thousand Orthoms of Jakob de Zoot, where this guy, Dr. Marinus, talks about growing up in a house that had, was full of books. And he says, to this printed library, to, to this printed garden, I was given the keys. And I feel I was like that as a child. I was lucky enough to grow up in a house that was full of books. So there were books on so many shelves of books more than I could ever read in my lifetime in the house I grew up in. So I was surrounded by books. I was, I was given you know, access to this printed garden as a child. So I was, I, they always seemed very familiar to me. And then I was lucky enough to have some great teachers. I have one particular teacher, this guy called Robert Wyke, who excited in me. I read Vanity Fair, our class read it with him. And he, he got me excited about Thackeray and about kind of Victorian literature in a way that no one else had. And then you know, I just was lucky to end up being a book publisher because it feels like I'm constantly surrounded by writers and books and 
I feel very blessed in that way. So I feel I've been, I continue to get a lot of inspiration from those people. And isn't it wonderful when somebody can encourage you like that? I mentioned I was at boarding school. So we were allowed downtown for 40 minutes on the left-hand side of the high street on a Saturday morning. Uh, and we didn't have very much money. And all the girls would go off and buy sweets and magazines and stuff. I went to a place called Thorpe's Bookshop and they realized, they got to know me in there, and it was a second-hand bookshop, and they realized I didn't have any money. And strangely, things like Jane Austen would appear in the 50p tray just as I came in, and it was, they just kept feeding. I realized Aww. after a while, they'd been feeding me all these books because I couldn't have afforded them, That's but they managed lovely. to put them in the 50p thing, so I will be grateful to them for the rest of my life. Um, any special memories when, of, of reading or being read to when you were younger, Bolu? I think I always nagged my dad to read to me, always, always. And whenever we went to, on family holidays to Nigeria, he would give me a £10 note and let me go to WH Smith and, and buy my book for, my, for the holiday. And when I went back to Lagos in December, I found like a massive box of all these books that I had when I was growing up and I kind of built my own library. So um, yeah, that's my, that's, that's my memory, just not even being excited about the holiday, just being excited about, about the book that I get to pick for the holiday. Um, yeah, it's very special to me. But any of those books when you were younger make you cross, make you think, actually, this doesn't represent me, or I don't want the girl to be saved, or I, you know? Um, I read a lot of, I read a lot of Radar, and I read a lot of Meg Habit, and I have to say, my taste was quite good. Oh, good. Because <laughs> <laughs> a, a lot of those authors also write adult books that I still read, and, I, and now I realise I was drawn to them because the girl always had um, a strong mind, which was really funny, and she wasn't necessarily fawning over the, the love interest. He had to kind of earn his way into her life, which I didn't know then, but I was drawn to. No, I, I, I can see that. I, I remember my very first book that I read was Janet and John. Does it, 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 no, no, I'm t you, John, Jamie's the only one I nodding. The Janet and John, yeah, thin on plot. Yeah. Janet gets little or nothing to do. It's very irritating. <laughs> um, what about you, David? I really got into American literature when I was 15 or 16. I read a lot of John Irving. I love John Irving. I always found them very emotional in the way that Dickens is as well. I, I remember reading Ken Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest and being absolutely devastated by it, just sitting and sobbing at the ending. Uh, oh, and so with Steinbeck thing. as well. Yeah. Steinbeck I, I, oh, I loved. Steinbeck, uh, it, was, it nearly did me in. Yeah. yeah. So those, the, realizing that, again, these, these marks on the page could have this huge emotional effect on you as well. Uh, that, was a, that was a real breakthrough for me. Now, we're talking here all the time about encouraging people to read. Um, Jamie, what about the people who who have s perhaps had struggled with reading. How can we reach out? I'm a big advocate for literacy, and I know what a big issue it is in this country. What, do you think there are any ways in which we can... Th I know that libraries do the best they can to, uh, to reach can out. I, I, it's been interesting during the lockdown, and it's happened over the last few years. There's been this extraordinary kind of growth in, in the listening to of audiobooks, and I... I, I I call that reading. I know on one level it's listening, so a pedant could say it's not reading, but actually you're doing many of the same things you need to do as a reader, which is to be attentive and be... And you're, you're, you're transported by the text, I suppose, and you have to use your imagination. And I, I think audiobooks is a brilliant way in for reluctant readers because that is what hooks you into story. It makes you realise, oh, my God, a, t a book can do this much for me. It can take me all these different places. It can affect me. I can learn from it. I can grow with it. It can make me feel connected with things and people and ideas I didn't know other people were thinking. All the, s the many things that we all love because we read loads. But people who don't realise that books contain everything. They contain everything that's, that's ever been imagined or dreamt of <laughs> is in a book. And, you know, and you can become things through reading that, you know, it, it can allow you to grow in ways. And I think audio is one of the most brilliant ways to do it. I also think, you know, I, I'm a fan of classics, but I think sometimes classics can be dangerous for, at a school level and the way they're mm. taught. And, and uh, you know, so I think we have to somehow... Make the joy of reading is the thing that, if that ever gets squeezed out, and it can be squeezed out for lots of reasons, and some people just might not have the attention spans to want to read. Some people are dyslexic. They really struggle to read and stuff. So I think you have to just recognise that everyone's an individual. Everyone needs possibly different things to make them tick. But I think audio is one of the great 
I, ways I, to kind of encourage literacy. I completely agree. And also, you mentioned you said you feel like you're in a reading group when you're at, uh, at, the, at your uh, book club. At your, yeah, yeah. book club. Um, so, uh, that is another way, isn't it? Have you had any association with any book clubs? Done? Is that a thing that? No, I've gone as a as an author, right, and been presented to the book group. And I always uh, lose sleep the night before, and it's always a real pleasure. <laughs> you know, I just think I'm going to get a lot you, of notes. So I'm just going to get a lot, of, a lot of criticism for things that I can't fix. <laughs> and it's going to be a really rough ride and they're not going to like it and it's terrible to be in a confined space with people who One haven't enjoyed your One person's going to work. point out the thing you go, oh no, that is right, that is a mistake. Yeah. Yeah, so I shouldn't but have done my that. My experience has always been really good and actually while we've been in lockdown I've, I've been able to do more than, than usual because it's very easy to jump on a Zoom call and talk to people about the book and it's, it's enjoyable. I, I think it's a wonderful thing to be able to discuss things. The and other if they thing. don't like it, you pull out the, the Wi Fi. Yes, I uh, say, oh, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> lost, con <laughs> lost connection <laughs> spinning. Um, the reading agency has revealed today that 53% of people have reread at least one book over the past year. If you could reread a book, Bonnie, what would it be? Um, it's going to be embarrassing for you. I always read one day. I always read the one day. I love this. <laughs> this is loving. I adore one day. Um, I read it when I was, I think I was 19 or 20, and I was like, this is it. It was so full of warmth and joy and romance and so emotionally intelligent. And I was like, these, these are the kind of stories I want to tell. Um, so, yeah, I always read, reread one day. Wow, thank <laughs> you. Okay, that's a compliment. Thank you. That's <laughs> wonderful. Thank you. Uh, what about you, Jamie? Is there a book that's a, that's a go-to for you? Uh, well, the trouble about being a publisher is that there are lots of things you have to read, manuscripts, and, and I say have to as if it's a, a, a burden or some sort of onus, and it, it sometimes does feel like that, but it, it's not often. It's things I really want to read. The book I've actually just started rereading, it's a bit of a pitch for a book, but it's something by this woman called Ruth Azeki. And I've just started rereading her novel, which we're publishing in September, called The Book of Form and Emptiness. And sometimes you have to reread a book to start to realize quite how brilliant a book is, quite what the author was intending at the beginning of the book, because you can't appreciate it till you've ended the book, finished the book. So that's the thing I, I'm actively in the process of rereading at the moment. And, uh, but I don't reread as much as I'd like because there's so much stuff out there I still want to read that I haven't read that yeah. would, could have been written. I've got, my reading list has, has hundreds and hundreds of books on it and that sadly means that it's not often I, I, that I want to reread things because there's other things I want to experience for the first time. Yes, I was trying to look today to see who was the last person to have read every book that had been printed and you do have to go back pretty much to Gutenberg's time, I think, in order to, we're never going to, we're never going to, <laughs> I think I was in Eloise and Abelard, I think yes, Abelard yeah. was meant to be the last yeah, person. Yeah. I know, him, it's, a, it's a while ago. <laughs> um, have you found writing during lockdown difficult? Has that been a tricky thing, David? Yep. Yep, straightforward <laughs> answer, okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's been impossible for me, I mean, as, as lots of people have pointed, I, I've written a lot about the past, about the 80s and 90s, and I thought I should write something contemporary, and suddenly the word contemporary doesn't really mean what it used to I, I, and I don't know whether to write something said in 2019 or 2023 I don't it's as really if, it's want as if to fiction particularly will have a dividing line now yeah. isn't it yeah yeah I mean it's fascinating in, in a way but I think it, that this whole experience perhaps needs time to, to percolate a little bit um, so I found it very hard I've also found um, the lack of contact with people very difficult I, I realized how much I don't think I steal stories or ideas from people, but I'm definitely stimulated by contact with lots of people and conversation. And but a bit of a magpie as well, curiosity. taking little yeah. pieces that all writers do that. And having spent most of the last year with the same three people, even though I love them and that's been an experience in itself, it hasn't been stimulating in the way that contact with my friends and strangers and just being out in the world is for me. So I've been, I've found it quite difficult, yeah. No, I can understand that. Didn't they discover that J.D. Salinger, after living in isolation for about 40 years, had written a lot of books? And I always thought, well, I wonder what he had to say, because he'd lived yeah. entirely yeah. by himself. So what's he drawing? Emily yeah, what's Dickinson. He? Well, I see, she's... I love Emily Dickinson. She's awesome. Her story, though, is amazing. Oh, I think she's a genius. Yeah. Um, I presume romance is going to be pre- and post-pandemic. There's not going to be... Is it going to be a tricky thing during the pandemic? Yeah, it was It was tough. <laughs> <laughs> it was tough. Um, you have to remind yourself what it feels like to be at a party and to feel that spark and the connection and be, it, even the chemistry of being around people that you really enjoy and really like, I had to remind myself of. So it was definitely tough. As a writer, you kind of have to, you have to experience the world in order to put it to page. 
Um, so yes, yeah, definitely something that I, that I struggled with. Um, but also that's when rereading came in, just to remind <laughs> myself what, it's, what the world is like. It opens up the world in a, in a different way when you can't actually be in the world. Do you know what? Sitting here just chatting about books, it's just been the loveliest thing. And looking people in the face. Yeah. And uh, there's a new thing. You just see the bottom, the top half of the face. Uh, I have absolutely loved it. Um, unfortunately, we are out of time. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's right. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Jamie and Bolu and David. It was really lovely you. uh, sharing your thoughts uh, with us. Um, so I hope that everybody at home has been inspired uh, to read some more and also to share your reading. Uh, with people around you because that is what World Book Night uh, is all about. Uh, we mentioned earlier that we would have some exclusive readings from Stories to Make You Smile. So we have a special message from the Reading Agency's partner for World Book Night, Spec Savers, and some special guests sharing extracts from their stories with us. Uh, don't forget to download your free copy of the book right now to end your World Book Night with a smile. Thank you so much, everybody. It's lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Reading has always been such a popular pastime and is certainly a passion of mine. This year, more than ever, being able to escape with a good book has been a lifeline for so many people, especially when we've had to spend more time at home and having something to smile about during these challenging times remains absolutely essential. Which is why Specsavers is delighted to be working with the Reading Agency to help make that possible by bringing you not only good vision and hearing, but our free short story anthology, Stories to Make You Smile. Now this is published by Simon and & Schuster and edited by Fanny Blake. The collection features some amazing authors, including Katie Ford, Dorothy Coombson, Richard Madley, Veronica Henry, Rachel Hoare, Vasim Khan and Eva Verdi. And we are guaranteed smiles from such witty writers such as Jenny Eclair, Helen Lederer and Mark Watson. Now you can download it for free as an e-book or you can listen to the audiobook. And that audiobook has been narrated by EastEnders actor Madhav Sharma. Downton Abbey stars Hugh Bonneville and Samantha Bond, as well as that star from Bridgerton, Adjoa Ando. And we really hope the stories bring a smile to your face. It's true, the interview has been a complete shambles, but he can't afford to vocalise his bewilderment at how badly things have been run. This is the horrible position that it puts you into, job seeking, somewhere between a polite visitor, an appreciative tourist, and a supplicant. Even when you see incompetence around you, even when it's almost embarrassingly clear that you would add value to the setup, because almost anyone would, quite honestly a badger in a suit would, you still have to feign admiration and respect. When the person interviewing you makes spelling errors in the introductory email, when the firm gets the time wrong and double books you, however amateurish the team and their actions, you still have to act as if it would be a privilege to join their ranks, because you are separated from them by one of the starkest measurements that can divide people. They have a job and you do not. The best thing Ma does these days is to turn any small worry into something for Sky. One small thing so the day is never completely black that keeps their small world turning free from interference the dreaded club Sky somehow loves, the library, a bus ride. Now it's a nice bun on the way home that the bread man always gives Sky to free, since Miles' pride melted enough to say thank you. Chopper looked thoughtfully at the man opposite him. Joshy was a bear, dressed in a navy safari suit, saddlebags of sweat under the arms. The air conditioner was out again and the office was sweltering. May in Mumbai, just before the monsoon. We're a lending agency, clarified Joshi. We lend money. Who do you lend it to? Whoever needs it the most. There was something evasive in the man's manner, Chopra thought. What exactly did Mirza take? Documents, valuable documents. Chopra watched him swat away a fly. 
And why do you suspect him? Because I terminated his position a month ago at the agency. He was unhappy. Revenge? Revenge, clarified Joshi emphatically. It'll take your mind off things. Janet's voice sounded so definite down the phone. I don't feel like shopping. Gemma screwed up her tired eyes. Besides, I've no money. We can at least look. I don't feel like looking or even leaving the house. Gemma, you can't stay in forever. But what if I'm recognised? It was the Eastern Gazette, not Sky News. Cat litter by now. The thought of her photograph lying under a feline bottom did not reassure Gemma. I must say, though, she sighed, I am getting cabin fever. All right, I'll meet you at the bus stop in half an hour. They knew the game already, this lot. They had to pretend to gnaw at the savoury before the sweet stuff was brought in. The troughs of their pelican bibs filled with crumbs. I relented pretty quickly and brought in plates of pink panther wafers, jammy dodgers and chocolate fingers. It was half past three. I looked around at my new friends, the dark circles under their eyes, the unbrushed hair, the baggy sweatshirts over the jeans, the air of slight desperation, but also the love in their eyes as they wiped tiny fingers with a damp flannel or brushed a lock of hair across a sweaty forehead. As the children grew tired of eating, we all clawed at the remains of the food casually, unable to resist the synthetic lure of children's party food. We needed the sugar too, to keep us going until bath time. It seemed an awfully long time away. As the hands of the clock dragged themselves round, I made an executive decision. We deserved a treat too, our grown-up equivalent of party food. Does anyone fancy a glass of wine?